Hello everyone, my name is Masood Ramandi and welcome to Perfected by Blood, a channel where we get deep into the mysteries of Christ. Today I have something very special for you. It's uh, a video from a conference that we did earlier this year. This is the first session and Rose is going to share with you uh, her story, her journey of how uh, she came to experience the love of God uh, while she didn't even know Jesus, but then she found that truth in the Bible in 1 John, which totally transformed her life. And uh, after basically the first half of this video, you're going to uh, hear from her some of the mysteries that are being uh, hidden in uh, the first epistle of John about Cain, Abel, and how that, how that uh, relates actually today to Christ and us. But uh, I want you to stay to the end. I want you to pay attention to what she says because this will be the foundation for the rest of the sessions where we are going to get into some of the misconceptions in the body of Christ concerning the nature of God, what He does, uh, His judgments, His righteousness, the day of the Lord and end times and so many other things based on the book of Revelation that, Revelations. Uh, that I believe is going to be uh, enlightening for many of you. So without further ado, I invite you to join me and watch this first session. <laughs> All right, welcome. Thank you so much for coming. This is an honor to be here, and we are so excited. Masud and I, from the first day, we just felt this freedom of speaking, and uh, not only from Pastor Vin and Laura, but also from the crowd. When I was worshiping, and it's interesting, in the last couple of months, every morning that I wake up, I wake up with the Bible app, audio Bible, and then I have I worship. And in the last couple of months, well, I have worship. I worship every day, but in the last couple of months, I worship. Masud and I worship with the first song that you played this morning. And when I woke up this morning, I said, "Oh, you know, I don't have time to do my worship with that song." And now we are here. And Masud said, "Oh, you know, we are like we are laughing." You know? And I didn't know. <laughs> I know it's just amazing because when you when you get to understand the Book of Revelation, all of a sudden you just. <laughs> It, worship becomes different to you. And today, um, what I want to do is, uh, I just want to share a little about our background and uh, share about where we came from and how we became Christian. But before that, let me tell you this. An Iranian ex-Muslim who lives in Canada and come to United States to preach about Jesus Christ, it's a miracle. Yeah. It's a miracle. I was born uh, in a Muslim family in uh, the central part of Iran, and my city is very famous with a very religious city. It's one of the, it's the second or third religious, most religious city in Iran. And um, so I have three brothers, and I remember growing up as a girl and the only girl, um, because that culture is very much son culture. They want boy. And I'm, I remember my mom was telling me uh, that when she was pregnant with my first brother, uh, the first child, uh, my uh, my grandma would tell my mom that if your first child is a girl, then I'm going to kill you. And my mom was always in this fear of having a girl. And then I was the second one. And um, so my, uh, my grandma would tell my mom that, okay, that's it. So you're not allowed to have another girl. That's more than enough. So uh, growing up as a girl, I always wanted to be a son not knowing that actually I am the son of God. <laughs> so I started really acting like, like boys. I wanted to compete with them. And um, so I went to karate. I was in the um, martial arts for so long and um, doing all the... Uh, you know, I was in competition, I have my medals too, you know, those. <laughs> um, and um, because I didn't know who I was, I didn't know the value of being a woman. 
the whole story of the Bible is about a woman. It started with a woman and ends with a woman in the book of Revelation. And, uh, and it's, all about, it's not about the woman that we talk. All of us have a woman nature inside of us. But the whole story is that when I was uh, 19 year old, years old, then I uh, decided uh, to commit suicide. Now, at the time, it was my mom's and dad's and family's fault. But now when I go back, I realize it's just a lack of identity and knowing who I was. So I wrote my goodbye letter, and uh, I called my friend, and I said, you know, so I'm just going to do this. And she was crying, and she, please, please, and all the stuff. I was like, no, I made my decision. So right before I uh, really do it, then I heard a thought, like a thought just went through my mind. And this thought told me that, you know, you never asked God, you never asked, um, you know, the creator, you never asked the one who made you, why did he make you? I was like, yeah, it's all his fault. <laughs> why do I need to talk to him? Why did I, why, first of all, I was born a woman, then in Iran, in a Muslim country, why didn't I get born in United States? <laughs> well, because I was going to come here one day. But, <laughs> so, um, so anyways, this thought told me, you know, you just, um, just ask. And I was in this confusion, hopelessness, I was going to kill myself, I had no plan and purpose in life. And I remember, I was like, well, I'm not going to lose anything. Um, so let me just do it and prove myself that there is no God, and if there is a God, I don't care. So uh, I started crying, and so what I'm about to share you, I found words for it when I became a Christian. Before that, I had no idea what happened to me. I would find words to try to explain what happened to me, and people turned me down. And Masood was the last one that told me, please don't share these things with me because I don't understand it. I don't believe in God and all this stuff. So, so in that moment that I was confused and I was like, okay, you know, um, I said, God, who are you? If you don't show yourself today, I will go, I will kill myself. And then I started cursing God and then I was like, oh, I'm sorry, I got afraid and then this confusion happening. And as I was um, just talking and cursing God and hatred and darkness and hopelessness, all of a sudden I felt the atmosphere got changed in the, in the room that I was in. And I felt a person walked into the room. Now, you need to understand, when you come from a Muslim background, we were told all, all of our lives that God does not. He doesn't visit you. He doesn't come to you. If someone comes and you think it's God, then it's not God, it's the devil. So, but I knew that I'm standing in the presence of my Creator. And these waves of love started coming and going through my body to the point that now I was crying out, I want to die, not because of all this hopelessness, because of the love that I was experiencing. The love that I was experiencing, it was so powerful that I knew my body cannot handle the amount of love I was experiencing. I felt I'm leaving my body and, and I knew if I want to have this love experience, it cannot be in this body. This body ha either has to change to another substance or I have to die and get free from this body so I can receive the amount of love that I was experiencing. So I was on the floor, I was crying and shouting and and I knew in a in a matter of a second I knew I knew from my whole being that I cannot have him I cannot have the fullness of who he is and I have to um, and I and I, I felt there is this thing between us and I couldn't grab him and have the fullness of who he is and all of a sudden in that moment I realized that was my sin and so I started repenting of my sin, and immediately I started saying, Lord God, I just come to my life. I make you my God. I make you my Savior. Years later, I found those words in the Bible. I started quoting the scriptures, which at the time I didn't know what I'm doing, but now I was, I was, what I was saying, I didn't understand what I'm saying. 
I think I got baptized with the Holy Spirit that day. I'm not, I don't know. But what, what happened was I started praying things that I couldn't understand. And I remember when I was coming back to myself, I was like, what am, what am I saying? And I remember the last sentence that I said. I said, I'm dedicating my life to me. Make yourself known to me, and my life is yours. Everything, every moment of my life is yours, so that you and I can be one together, and we experience the perfection in life, the purpose that you made for me. So um, the uh, verse in Romans chapter 8 um, was actually, I was quoting that, I was quoting, and later on, it was the verse that we became Christian. Uh, so I didn't know there is a book like Bible. I didn't know there was a book called Bible. But that was the verse in Romans chapter 18, sorry, Romans chapter 8, that it says, uh, moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these also he glorified. So when I came, when that experience was finished, I had no idea that his name was Jesus. I thought I experienced the God of Islam. So here's what a lot of doctrines will be shaken. Because we think God will show up into our lives when we become a Christian. We think he starts loving us when we turn to him. We think that we become sons of God or the children of God when we say, oh, Jesus, come into my life. It was a moment that you realize that you have always been the son of God. It's a moment that you see yourself as the way that he sees you, but he has always been your father. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, you don't see yourself as son. You, don't, you didn't call him the father first. He called himself the father first. So you didn't, call, he, you didn't call yourself the son of God first. He called you my son first. So now that happened to me when, I, when I was, I'm 19. So in the next 10 years of my life, I became so religious. I was waking up early morning doing all the rituals about Islam. Then I got to know Masood. So Masood is uh, also from a religious family. And um, so I remember that day when I was praying, one of the things I was praying, I said, Lord, you know, um, who do I need to marry to? So you bring that person to me. And, um, and I'm not going to look for anyone. So you just make that happen. And um, when I met Masood for the first time, it was interesting. It was five years later, that experience. And in, the last, in that five years, I wanted to have that experience again. But I couldn't. I wanted to have what happened to me that time again, but I couldn't. And one time, I was doing all these prayers and ritual in Islam, but one time, one day when I was at home, sleeping at night, I remember that I spoke to him with my own language. I can talk to him right now. So, and I said, Oh, my love, my love. I called him love. I had no name for him. I went to the Quran, I read it. Allah didn't fit into his character. The experience of love that I had, it didn't fit in the character of Allah that I had in Islam. So I called him love, and I would call him love. I said, God, you are love. And the moment I talked, started talking to him, that presence would come on me. And I would experience not into the same thickness that I had experienced, but um, in a di different level. So when I met Masood for the first time, so um, I really like to tell you that I was um, still hurt, even though I had that experience and I didn't want to commit suicide, but I was still hurt because I didn't know the truth. The spirit and truth makes you free. Yes. Yes. The, the truth is what makes you free. And I was in that uh, still hurt and everything, and I remember I was in a chat room. with my, I wanted to come to Canada, and I started chatting with this guy in English, and I realized that he's Iranian, and he's studying master's degree in chemical engineering in one of the universities in my city. And I was like, oh, man, this guy is genius. I better go and make some fun of him. <laughs> so... 
I called my friend and I said, you know what, I, I was living in Dubai at the time, so in summertime I would come to Iran. And I said, well, I'm really bored. I'm going to call this genius guy, probably has those thick glasses and is studying 25 hours a day <laughs> because, because, he was, because he was in one of the top universities in Iran, so second or third university. Every year there are one million people go to this um, uh, entry exam for universities, and at the time it was about one million people, and they needed around, uh, is it one million at the time? I don't know. So they needed around maybe um, something around 100,000 people only get there. And he's my, when I had that exam, my, my number was 70,000, so I couldn't get anywhere. But his number was 250 out of one million people. So, <laughs> so that means he's really a smart guy. So now, <laughs> I don't like to see smart guys, so I'm gonna go make fun of them. So at the time, so at the time I told my friend, and my friend said, can I come with you so we can make fun of him together? I was like, no, I'm gonna go alone myself. So that was my intention, to meet Masood in the first time. And uh, it's interesting, because the moment I saw him, the voice, the audible voice spoke to me, and it was from inside, of, um, inside out, every single cell in my body was talking to me and said, he is the one you prayed for, he is the one you asked for, he is the one that God wants you to marry. And of course, I fought with that voice for some times. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> but later on I said, God, if he's the one, so make it happen. So long story short, we got married, and it wasn't easy because my family didn't want us to marry, but we got married, and we came to Canada. Masood found a scholarship uh, in his, for his PhD um, in one of the universities in Toronto, and uh, we came to Canada. But the reason we came to Canada, it wasn't for school, it wasn't for education, it was to find peace. We thought that, you know, maybe the country, we need to change our country to find peace. So we came to Canada and we had peace, but for six months. And after six months, I'm thinking, I have everything that I want in my life. Like, all my life, I was growing up with all those things, and I always thought I'm going to have a worse marriage and worse life. And all of a sudden, I had everything that I wanted to have. I have the best marriage, and I have everything. But what is it that I'm lacking something? So when we were coming to Canada in the, in the plane, I remember I prayed. And this is not a prayer that a Muslim would do. Muslims don't talk to God with their own language. You will need to speak in Arabic to God. I think God doesn't understand. I don't know. But <laughs> I never got it. But, uh, but you need to speak. You, don't, you can't speak with your own language. So I remember when we came into Canada, I said, God, Lord, my love, um, we are going to this country, and I know you brought us to this country, but I don't know you. Who are you? Show yourself to us. And I pray that when we come to this country, you come to our way and make people in our path that they know you so that we come to get to know you, to know who you are. We landed in Canada, and to, then we landed 7 p.m. in Canada, and 8 a.m. the next day, a Christian, a, a, we were introduced to this Christian friend who became our close friend, and before we know, we were surrounded with Christians. And they started finding place for us, and f food, and filling up our house, and all this stuff, and talking about Jesus. But I didn't want to hear about Jesus, because I know God. I experienced him, and um, this Christian woman, was she was so amazing. And I remember one time I told her, you know, I experienced God, and I told her my experience, the most valuable thing that I had from God. And for years I told people, and no one understood me, I would tell people God is love, and they would like, what are you talking about? From 99 names of Allah, none of them is love. Oh, wow. <laughs> Allah has 99 names, and you're saying God is love, you're out of your mind. Actually, my mom took me uh, to doctor, and I was on depression medication. 
because of experience that I was telling to people, and I realized I need to tell them that, um, no, okay, I didn't have it. And um, so I, I thought I can share with her, and when I shared with her as a Christian, unfortunately, she turned back to me and she said, that was the devil. Aww. So now, because I'm not blaming her, but she's growing up, you know, God's going to show up when you, when you show up. God's going to show up in your life when you turn to God. And it was really, it, was, it hurt me so much that uh, we told her, we don't want to hear about Jesus. If you want to be our friends and talk about Jesus, we don't want to talk to you. And we were really rude. Since after that, every time we would see a Christian, just debating with them and be rude. And this Jesus you're talking, it's nobody and all the stuff. A friend of us gave us the Bible and said, why don't you read the Bible? And, you know, I was like, okay. So Masud and I started reading the Bible from Genesis. And uh, uh, <laughs> when, I read, when Masud read the Bible, the first 50 page, he threw the Bible away. <laughs> and he said, this is the most ridiculous book I have ever heard in my life. Don't waste your life to, to read it. I was like, oh, yeah, no, I'm just going to continue reading uh, Next page, next dragging. When I got to Psalms, like, oh yeah, that's nice, nice, nah, nah. I got to uh, Matthew, and I got all the way to Matthew, and I stopped. Matthew said, well, do you think I should read? I was like, nah, there's nothing in there. What is this book? <laughs> we basically threw the Bible away, um, and we are like, you know, this is nothing in this book. Oh, the Quran is better. <laughs> um, one year later, um, uh, I was driving home, and, um, and I remember I looked back in my life, and I, um, I, I saw I have everything, but this lack is inside of me. I saw I don't have peace. And um, I'm, uh, I'm driving home, and it's like this, uh, it was September, October, uh, 2011, and it was, you know, in Toronto, it's very beautiful, the fall season, um, you know, like yellow and red leaves, and so beautiful. I'm driving outside, it's so beautiful, but inside, it's ugly. And I remember I went forward, <laughs> and, uh, and, and I looked up to heaven, and I said, and I had no idea what I'm saying, so I said, who are you? Why are you sitting up there and you have left us alone in this life? Why don't you become a human being like us so you can experience our pain so that when I come to you, you know that I have a pain? <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> Actually, he came. <laughs> yes. But at the time, it wasn't funny. I was really serious. Because in that moment, I realized that if God is God and he is love, he, he can't stay in distance. He had to share with you your pain. He had to experience your life. He can't, he can't be apart from you. And, and I remember, you know what? Many years ago, I had this encounter with you. I think people are right. It was just out of my mind. I can't really believe there is a God. So by the time I got home, so now imagine Masood is working on his PhD thesis, right? Like for his final graduation. And Masood, from when he was six years old, now sharing his testimony. When he was six years old, because of the family that he came from, he said, you know what, I want to grow up, I want to be an engineer, and I want to make my own life for myself. So this is many years later, and everything that he had planned had already come to pass. And now, from the year of six years old, he was actually living alone with grand, with, they sent they volunteered him, as he says, to his grandma, and then he moved to the different city because the city he comes from is a village. They only give you education till grade five. So he had to go to a bigger city and bigger city to, in order to obtain education that he wanted to have. So 
He's sitting home, and maybe if you share it, do you want me to share it? Yeah. He's, he's sitting home, probably he should share it better. But he's working on his, edu his um, book, but maybe you can share later uh, too. <laughs> but he's, all of a sudden, he, he hears a thought in his mind at the same time that I am driving and talking to God. He's, he, hears a, he hears this voice in, in his mind, and he says, do you know who you are? And for a minute, he gets up off the chair, and then he goes and he lays down. He's like thinking all his life. And he brings all those logics as engineer bring. You know, everything needs to be logical, equal to this. And he goes through all these things, and he makes a conclusion. There is no God. By the time I come home, and we're talking together, and I said, okay, Masood, um, we're just sitting, we are broke. <sighs> no joy, no peace. We didn't know peace is a person. We didn't know joy is in something. It's not in lack of it's not in the lack of problems, it's in some person. So we're sitting home, and I said, Masood, uh, you know, I don't know why God allows all those sickness and everything. And he stopped me there, and he said, I don't believe there is a God. And in that moment, I was confronted because I had experienced God, and I couldn't prove to him there is no God. And then uh, there is a God, and he couldn't prove to me there is no God. And we ended up having hours of conversation together, and we realized that finally, uh, we, Masood said, you know what? Maybe we should do this. Maybe we should, for the first time in our life, maybe we should look for the truth. Mm. Not for God. Let's look for the truth. And we are like, okay, so this is what I did. If you are up there, show yourself to us. This is the only one-time opportunity. If... <laughs> I'm going to look for you, for the truth of who you are. And if I come to a conclusion and later on I die and go to hell and they told me that's a wrong God, it's your fault. <laughs> right? Isn't it logical? <laughs> I was like, I'm going to have this uh, search period of time and you better show yourself. <laughs> so we called our Christian friend and uh, so now imagine he, he took us to Alpha course. You want to come to Alpha course now? No. They give food. Oh yeah, we're coming. <laughs> So for two and a half years, this poor guy is just like trying to talk about Jesus. And we're like, you're tired of this Jesus. Now, we call him, and, and Masud and I, we said, well, we've been to mosque uh, always. Let's go to a Christian church. So I call our friend and say, hey, Mo, son, uh, do you go to church this week? And he goes, yeah, why? He was eating something. I said, well, can we come? He goes, <coughs> what? <laughs> what? You want to come where? <laughs> so... So we went to church. It was, it was, it was, we went to church, and it's, he took us to the balcony, not to the crowd. There was a balcony up there. Nobody was there. And uh, when you seek him, he will show himself to you. And when we went up there, there was this uh, banner hanging on the wall. And not knowing that Masood and I, we read that together, and I came to myself, I realized Masood is crying. And in the banner on the wall said, joy comes by knowing God. And we knew, wow, we are in this path of knowing him. And the moment we made that decision, we were excited about it. We were like, oh, something good. We were excited. We didn't know why are we excited. So we ended up going to this church, and we were reading the Bible. One night I woke up, and I saw Masood is crying. He was reading the Bible. Because I would go early to work, so I would go to bed early and speak, uh, sleep there. And, but I woke up, and he was in the bed, and he had the lamp stand on, and, and he's reading, and he's crying. So I was like, oh, I've never seen him cry before. Oh, Muslim men don't cry. <laughs> it's a, it's, they are so proud and have a pride to cry. Cries for girls. <laughs> so I saw him crying, and I was like, oh, I turned back, so I pretended I didn't see you. <laughs> I didn't want to break his pride, you know? It was my mentality. 
<laughs> so anyways, when later on, I realized that he's reading Matthew chapter 5 and Matthew chapter 6, that all of a sudden Jesus is talking about the Father here. And he's and he started experiencing this um, love that God is not distant. Actually, he's a father. And imagine as a Muslim, all my life, 17 times a day, I confess that God does not have a son and he's not a father. And all of a sudden we're confronted with this Jesus who is the son of God. So how can you handle that? So in our journey, it was a long journey for us. So one day I came home and we read the Bible and I came home one day after a few months of that decision and many things, many things happened. I remember after one month, um, we were coming back from the church and Masood said, have you noticed everything has changed only in one month that we have started reading the Bible? We have peace and everything. And we could see those changes are happening in our life. And so a few months later, we got to end of January 2012. And uh, I, got, I got home around 5 o'clock. And I just fast forward. And uh, Masood said, well, where are you in your readings? And I said, well, I finished the book of John. And I am in the middle of book of Acts. And he said, yeah, I read the book of Acts. And should we read uh, Romans together? Maybe we should do that. And we are like, OK, yeah. So we sat down from 5 o'clock to 12 at midnight. And we read together. We would read a paragraph. And he would say what he thinks. And I would say what I think. And we would just study the Bible together. We didn't know we were just studying the Bible. So from 5 to 12 in midnight, I cannot explain to you the most, it was the most powerful time that we, had, we have had up to that moment in our lives. And uh, we read from Romans chapter 1 and all the way to Romans chapter 8. Three, we were on the floor crying, and I remember, Masood, why are we crying? Masood, I don't know, I don't know. Like, Masood, oh, I can't, I can't. So we were heat, hot, we are crying, and we read it. So it got to the point, in the beginning, we would read like, one paragraph and talk, and now we got to Romans chapter 7, and we are reading verse by verse, and we are just, it's so hot, and we're like excited talking about it, and, and not knowing the answer is the next verse, and the next verse. It gets to Romans chapter 7, it says, what? It says, look at me, I want to do good, but I can't, and I don't want to do the bad, but I can't, and my sister and I, yep. Yeah. <laughs> This is telling us the problem that we have. That's it. See, I close the book. I said, see, even this book acknowledges that we cannot be good and we cannot stop doing the bad. This is who we are. And all of a sudden, we are like, okay, wrapping up and closing the session, like the session we had together. And all of a sudden, uh, I look at the next verse uh, toward the end of chapter 7, and I said, Oh, <laughs> pray, who can deliver me? Who can deliver us from what a wretched man that I am? But praise God to Jesus Christ. And we are like, oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> He can deliver us from this situation. The whole world is talking about the problems that we have, but nobody brings the solution. And here's the solution, Jesus Christ. So we got to chapter 8. We are like, okay, so let's continue reading. So three. So now we are excited. Um, um, the moment we had that, in that five hours of reading, we three times we felt someone walked into the room. Masudana, we both turned toward one direction. We couldn't see anyone, but someone was standing there. And then we fall on the ground, ground cry, and we don't know why are we crying. And all of a sudden, we have downloads of revelation. And now, oh, Jesus, man. Praise God. So we got to Romans chapter 8. And I remember Masu was sitting. I think that's one of the guys. Masu was, was, we were reading almost, we got to Romans chapter 8. And, oh, thank you.
I'm just sharing a stories this one session, and the next three days is going to be teaching. So, <laughs> yeah. So we got to Romans chapter eight, the same verse that I read earlier that I was praying at the time when I was going to commit suicide. I remember Masoud was reading and he just dropped the Bible and he started weeping loud. And I'm crying and he's like, oh, Jesus is truly the son of God. And I'm like, Masoud, how did you get to that conclusion? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I don't know. And I said, Masood, you remember Peter? Jesus told Peter, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. Masood said, yeah! <laughs> yeah. 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 Masood said, yeah. I said, I think Father revealed that to you. And Masood said, you know what is interesting? We can all be the sons of God. Yeah. He knew us before the foundation of the world. And he called us to be just like Jesus. I can be the son of God. So um, we, we were weeping and crying. And I didn't go to work the next day. I called in sick. And I said, I can't go to work. I have to finish this book. We woke up 8 o'clock in the morning, and we kept reading till 9 p.m. non-stop. Non-stop. We couldn't get, like, it just, like, so much in there, but we couldn't finish it, of course. And um, then um, all of a sudden, I said, well, you know what? I have to finish this book. And I have some Christians friend told me, don't read the book of Revelation. There must be something there they don't want us to know. I'm just going to read the whole thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so in the next one week, Masood was praying for me so that I also come to that uh, you know, moment yeah. that, you know, what it wasn't hitting for me. What does it mean? The blood of Jesus. What does it mean? So we got to the book of Hebrews. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So Masood would say, well, see, see, Rose, 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 that's your answer. That's your answer. And I was like, what? You're now Christian. You're trying to make me a Christian. <laughs> He's like, no, 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 no. I mean, like here has your answer. So <laughs> before this incident, let me tell you this before this incident, before that night, we would go to cell groups, prayer groups, Bible study groups, and we would go to the prayer group, and they would say, okay, so now we were in the prayer group with the pastor and a couple of elder leaders, and, we, and they said, okay, let's pray, and we would fall on the ground, and we cry loud, Lord God, make yourself real, make this faster, who are you? And we cry, and the Christians like, <laughs> and now we are Muslims and crying out. And the next week, the pastor went and I said, I need to confess. We have forgotten our first love. I've had two Muslims coming, crying out for God that I haven't had that for years. Okay, we need to confess Father. And they were weeping and crying because, we, because they saw it's not about going to church and doing things. It's about knowing him and who you are. <laughs> so anyways, one week went on and I got to, the, to, the, to first John. And when I got to that verse, it hit me. Because for 10 years, I went around and telling everybody that God is love. And they told me, you know what? You're out of your mind. I was like, yeah, probably. You know, <laughs> it's not something that mind can comprehend. So I got to this verse. And all of a sudden, I, I saw the verse. I saw the sentence that I would use to, for God. God is love. I was like, oh, yes, this book is explaining the God I experienced when I was 19. 
So we finished, we got to the book of Revelation and we are leading. Oh, that's interesting. Dragon seven. Oh, yeah, head. Ah, oh, scroll. City. And we read it all. We didn't understand a bit of it. But I wanted to know if there's something there that Christians don't want us to know. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't read the book of Revelation. It's very scary. I was like, okay, I gotta go read it. <laughs> so I um so the I, it was February 2nd, 2012 at 9:38 at night. See, I know the time. <sighs> That's the most important thing happened to our life. So, so we got to this master said, okay, we read, we read the Bible, um, so what should we do? So in my mind, I'm going through all these things, and I said, I was preparing myself to say, Master, I think, um, I think, you know, we read the Quran and the Bible, I think we need to go and study some other religions in depth to make sure our search is complete, so that we can, but my heart, of course, was touched with this. And um, so I was about to say that, and what came out, it shook me to the core. I did not want to say it when I wanted, when I said it, but when I said it, I was convinced. And because God listens to your heart, not the mind that tries to hold you back. So I said, I said, Masood, I think we believed in our heart. We need just to confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. <laughs> And of course, Masood got up, yes! <laughs> and um, we gave our life to Jesus. That moment, we sat down, we prayed, we gave our life to Jesus, and we knew that was just the beginning. Wow. That was just the beginning of our walk with the reality of who God is. So here's the thing. As a Muslim... When I became a Christian, I had the religion, no thank you, I don't want another religion. I was looking for something real. I'm still looking for something real. When we come and read this Bible with amazing things that we are reading, it's just the beginning. It needs to become the reality in our lives. As a Muslim, when I, I came to Jesus not because he said nice things, because he is real. Yes. Yes. He's just the most real person I have ever seen in my life. We started reading the Bible again. Masood had this wrote at the end, finished, 9.38, or I don't know what time exactly, um, that day date for the first time. He wrote at the end of his book for the first time. The next day, we got up, we sent a message to our Christian friends. They didn't believe us. They came to test us to make sure that we are Christians. Oh, boy. <laughs> so, anyways, we, uh, we went around listening to 100 preachers at a time. One would say, you need to rebuke the devil. Another says, you know, you don't need to rebuke the devil. You just need to do this. And one says, you need, uh, we are like going from here to here and there. And it went on for a few months. And all of a sudden, we realized, okay, that's not working because... <laughs> Because I'm confused. <laughs> you need to undo everything you learned. Someone else says you don't need to undo everything you learned. So Masood and I, we came from a Muslim background, and we, all those garbage we, we carried for years. And all of a sudden, we realized, you know what? What if we leave our garbages and, uh, and the bags we are carrying, good or bad, everything that we know about God, what, what if we leave it behind, never visit it, and trust God that he will reveal new things to us? Yeah. And you know what? Do you know this is, we are still doing that. Yeah. Okay, we, when God came, okay, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to teaching mood now, so 
<laughs> but I, I try to come back to some stories. Uh, when, um, when God gives you this, in some point, you need to leave it. If you grab hold to this one, this becomes your God. Right? If even what God gives you today, it shouldn't become your God. You need to decide to leave it behind. This is called death. Every, the word of God is a seed. And in order for a seed to grow, it needs to fall onto the ground and dies. Every word of God that gives you, it shouldn't become God to you. All right. So when you hear from God and God speaks to you and all of a sudden you go, oh man, hoo, hoo, hoo. you jump up and down and we forget. We shouldn't forget that this is him that is important. I don't follow Masood because he gave me some good promises. I live with him and I love him, not because he gave me some promises, but because I love him. Sometimes the promises of God becomes more important than God himself. So if you want to grow, you need to leave what you already know. Even it's the truth. You know, for years and years, people, I noticed that when I, I started going to churches, and I noticed people are, 20 years later, this verse says this. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, wait a minute. We are saying that this book is alive, and that means every time I read this verse, every single time, it has to have something new for me. Yeah. Otherwise, this verse is dead to me today. Yeah. Otherwise, it's been 20 years. And every time I read it, right now with our group, they say, Rose and Masood say, <laughs> two years later, Rose and Masood say, or so and so said, it has to come into a place of, oh, okay, now I get it. I have that revelation. So when we started Masood and I, what we did, we went back to the Bible. We bought the Bible in English. For the first time, Master said, I think we need to read in English. And I'm like, what? I've never read any book in English. And then what I would do, I, so I had the end of my uh, Bible, I had this paper, and I would go, the revelation, or oh, what does revelation mean? So I would go to dictionary. I write it down here for myself. This is what revelation means. And out of 10 words that is in English, I didn't know nine, sometimes nine and a half. And I would write them and translate that in Farsi. And by the time I get to the next word, I was like, okay, what was revelation? Oh, okay, okay. So we started studying the Bible in English, <clears throat> Masood didn't, Masood didn't know how to, uh, Masood didn't speak English at all. And he started reading it in English, to, and we were so excited. We go to church, and they're like, how was your week? And we're like, oh man, you know, in John chapter 3 says this, Jesus is praying, and we are talking about the revelation we receive. And one day, one of them said, you know, you guys need to bring some balance into your life. You can't read the Bible all the time. <laughs> And I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> this book changed my life. I mean, it has become my hope. I didn't have any direction in my life. Now I know who I am. I'm not there yet, but I know who I am. So I can be in the past to get me there. So if I don't know where I'm going, how can I get there? <sighs> I was at work, and my uh, ship, uh, my um, shipping coordinator called me, and um, so this is a couple of years ago, and uh, I was talking to him, and he said, okay, Rose, hold on a second. Hey, dude. So he's talking to the driver, to the truck driver. Where are you going? And he goes, I don't know. He's like, 
If you don't know where you're going, how can you get there? And, and the Lord spoke to me right then. And so, <laughs> and, and said, Revelation is a light to your path. The Word of God shows you where to go. The book of Revelation is the light to your path too because it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. We are going to spend a lot of time in the book of Revelation. But I want to wrap up the story so we can get to the meat, you know. Um, so, <clears throat> so we started reading Masood after two months. Masood is excited. He doesn't care if he's speaking English incorrectly. Wrong words. He doesn't care. He goes around talking to everyone and within two months he was speaking fluently. That's a miracle, guys. You know, how can you learn a language from a Bible? <laughs> and hopefully as Pastor Vincent, not the King James Bible, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't read the King James. <laughs> we read the new King James. We like everything new. That's why we read the new King James. <laughs> it's a new day, new heaven, new earth, new covenant. Everything about God is new. <laughs> uh, so Masud and I, we went around, and finally after two years, you know, we went around on the street praying for people. People started getting healed. I remember the first day, uh, I uh, like... It didn't happen immediately, and we would go every day and pray for people for healing because we we're like, okay, Jesus said, let's go. And <clears throat> so it took it took some times, but until one day, Masuda and I we were uh, together with this Christian friend that we had met the first time, and uh, so we I went and I <clears throat> got to this boy, the young boy, and he had the cast on, and I said, hey, do you have any, you have problem with your knees, and he goes, yeah, I said, well, can I pray for you, and he goes, um, so he looks a young, beautiful lady asking for prayer, you know, so he goes, oh, okay, you know, <laughs> so it was a young boy, and the, the friend would say, he left, and he didn't really care about prayer, and he went and stood there on, like, watching phone, you know, and uh, <clears throat> so I sat on my knees, and I put my hand, and now imagine we are in a flea market, I don't know, if you guys have a flea market, <laughs> we are in the flea market, so we had Indians, and we had uh, Muslims, and everyone, so they all came around, like, what is she doing, you know, so I prayed for her, and she's like, no, nothing. I said, well, can you please let me know, let me pray for you again? And he goes, yeah, okay. So I prayed for him. He said, well, that's weird. It got hot there. And I'm like, okay, um, can you walk? He's like, listen, before, I couldn't walk, but I can try. I said, okay. So he gave me those crutches, and I'm getting, getting the crutches, and he's like, oh, oh, okay. So he took this thing out. Oh, okay. So now the friend's like, <laughs> I don't want to know anything. So I'm like, he told me no actions. I was like, I didn't believe it when he said, yeah, he got healed. I didn't. That was the first time. I said, are you sure? He said, yes, I am sure. I said, listen, don't be nice because I'm a nice girl here and beautiful. Stand. Don't be nice. If Please tell me if you're He's like, no, I'm good. So I got, I was so excited. I got Masood, Masood. I ran, found Masood. And I was telling Masood in our language what happened. So I said, this is what happened, da, 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 da. There is this woman here, Iranian, and I didn't know. And she turned to us and she said in Farsi language, she said, really? You're like, oh, yes. And then I said, well, you have a back pain. And she goes, how did you know? I said, well, it doesn't matter. Let me pray for you. She goes, okay. So I said, in Jesus' name, be healed. She goes, oh, what did you do? <laughs> so now we had that happened, and it was interesting because <clears throat> uh, we, we got off uh, out of the flea market, and we prayed for a woman with the crutches again. So she she gave the crutch to husbands. I don't need those, you know, African American with uh, strong personality, uh, you know. And she's like, I don't need those. I can walk now. So she she walked and. <clears throat> It was amazing. So we would go outside and pray for 25, 50, 100 people a day and see healings happen like this. And um, I remember we got home one day after many months, and, uh, uh, and Masood looked at me and said, Rose, 
It must be something bigger than healing. Yes. We're like, okay. So we, we get back to the book of Romans and we started reading the book of Romans. We got to Romans chapter 8 again. And I remember I wrote in my journal. A few years later, I found it. So when the spirit of life that raised Jesus from the dead, the dead body of Jesus, it starts coming to my body and it starts giving life to my body, that means my body starts receiving life. So death is the absence of life. So that means Christians shouldn't die. I was like, that sounds blasphemy. No. No. So Masood and I, what we did, we continued reading. So we started studying the Bible um, many hours as we could. So I'm not saying this to, um, to say how we know, because we don't know everything. Uh, but I want to encourage you, and just to be encouragement to you, um, that you know there's so much hidden in this book that we are here to discover this book. Masood and I have read the Bible up to 17, 18 hours a day. And we don't just read it, we study the Bible. Yes. We go deep into it because there is so much more. Because the moment you come, a couple of years ago, three years ago, we, we were going around speaking in some places, and everybody, wow, wow, wow. And I remember I told Masood, Masood, you know what? There must be more. And even today, a couple of days ago, we were talking together. He says, there must be more. There must be more. So we don't want to get stuck into what we already know. And every time, everything that God gives you, it's exciting, but you need to leave it behind so that you can grab new things. So I'm not talking about materialism. Oh, we had a friend coming. I don't want to lose my house. And so I'm not talking about your house and car, and I'm not talking about your possession. I'm talking about what is inside of you and the revelation and the understanding of who God is. The more Masood and I, we read the Bible, the more we realize that Christianity is about knowing God and in knowing Him, all of a sudden you find yourself in Him. So, And when you find yourself in Him, you realize that Jesus Christ didn't come to make you a good person. Jesus Christ came to raise you from the dead and bring you into the glory of God. He came to give you life and immortality in your soul, spirit, and in your body. Jesus came to show you who you really are. Or by, by looking at him, you see yourself. And when you see him, you, will, you know yourself the way he knows you. Yes. This is, this, is, this is what this book is talking about. John chapter 17 says that um, uh, this, Jesus is praying to the Father and... He says like that, um, this is eternal life, to know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. So now we are like, okay, that that doesn't mean for eternity you're going to know him, which you may. But what it says is in knowing him, you have eternal life. When you know him, the life of the gospel of God in the face of Jesus Christ is start flowing into your beings and you start experiencing this life even right now. And this is what I'm going for. This is what Masood and I are. We are striving day and night, studying the Bible, going back and forth, going deep, because we want to know how can we live this thing. Yes. Yes. That's why we have this conference here, and we are so excited because there is one thing to to know where you are starting. There is one thing to know where you are going, but there is another thing to get to go to the path that takes you there. Jesus says, "I am the way, the truth, and the life." And no one comes to the Father except through me. What is he saying? He says, first, you come and realize that I am the way. And through that, you realize that, okay, I'm the truth. And then you start having life. And then you realize that I'm the Father. Mm. It starts with the way. Ends with the Father. 
the moment you start in a way and then you have the truth, then you start having life and all of a sudden you see the Father and the moment you see the Father, you see, you see yourself because you are from His DNA. Yes. Yes. You just look like Him. Yes. Yes. And then as you go through that path, the metamorphosis starts happening. Yes. You leave this shell behind and every thought that you have and every intention of your heart that you already think this is who God is, you start leaving that aside and you come to a place that you don't judge yourself anymore. You don't say, this is who I am. I'm not a morning person. I'm this, I'm that. You come to a place that you realize that there is no judgment that you know against yourself because he's the righteous judge and now he can judge me. Yeah. And he judged me righteously. Yes. And he, what he says I am, that is who I am. And everything else is a lie. Amen. All right, so let's go to First John. Now I'm getting started. <laughs> so I'm not going to go too deep here. Um, just want to have this uh, session a little inspiration, a little waking up. Yeah. Um, oh, Jesus. What a God. <clears throat> In the last eight years, Masood and I, maybe we have talked almost every month. Could you even imagine when you were a Muslim that that is the truth? Uh, we have a friend, he's uh, studying in Ravi Zacharias uh, College, and I was talking to his wife, and she was saying one of the, uh, one of the uh, famous Islamic theologians, so he was in a meeting, the, we did, you know, they have their debates basically, uh, their ministry is that. So one of those Islamic, uh, famous Islamic theologian, uh, answers the question to this a student who asked the question. Uh, I don't know what was the question, but this is what he says. The Bible and the gospel is too good to be true. <laughs> I think someone asked him, why don't you believe? And he said, it's too good to be true. What if it's too good? And it's so true. What if, what if our journey of knowing God, it brings us in a place of understanding his love? And the moment you know his love, you can trust. And the moment, you know, let me tell you this. Paul writes to Timothy and says, Timothy, my son, the scriptures are written for admonishing and it's also to make you wise for salvation. So we can't afford to take a look at the Bible and say, okay, let me see what this book is saying. What, that, what do I need to do? And open up the book and see what to do. This book is written to give you a wisdom. Because no one can tell you what to do because you are an individual created in the image of God and you are in a place that, okay, you, the, the, he needs to guide you and lead you to show you the way to tell you where to go and what to do. So the, the, the scriptures gives you wisdom to live the way we're supposed to live. But we can't afford to take a look at the scripture and see what it, mean, what it says this book, let me go and do it, rather than that we, have, we need to read the scriptures and understand and receive a wisdom. And uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 tells us that the wisdom of God is in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. That's the wisdom that brings all the other wisdom to foolishness. And this is how we know that he loves us, that he gave his life for us. So the wisdom of God is the love of God manifested on the cross. Yes. Yes. So that means every time you read the scriptures, then you need to find the love of God in there. Yeah. Sometimes maybe we don't understand that the book of Revelation is so scary and we get fearful, but perfect love casts out fear. Amen. So when you come to the book of Revelation, you need to receive the most loving God in those verses. Yes. 
not the God that goes and kills, and you don't see the love in there. So now we come, okay, let's come to uh, 1 John. <clears throat> Uh, chapter 3. What time is it? 11.10? Okay. Do I have to 12? Or should I finish earlier? Do, yeah, I'm good? Okay. All right. First John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. Right? What manner of love love is in this? Cam is the moment you call yourself the son of God, the child of God, it's when that means you have experienced the love of the Father. Yes. Right? Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. All right? Do you see what manner of love we know him? What manner of love we know him? Do you see, in knowing him, you receive the love. Yes. And in receiving the love, you get free from fear. And once you're free from fear, you're loved. In, uh, in uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 says that um, he became flesh and blood to, that by his death to destroy the one who had the power of death and deliver those who through the fear of death, they were in bondage all of their lifetime. So that means fear brings death. Love sets you from fear. That's why you're free from death. Yes. In knowing him, you have life, love, and in knowing love, you have life. Yes. You're looking for eternal life? It's in love. Yes. It's in knowing him. If you want to live this life, you need to abide in his love. If you want to abide in his love, you need to come to know him intimately. Yes. You, have, you raise your hand? Oh, no, I'm just okay. Oh, perfect. <laughs> I thought you had a question. So, <laughs> so, so now, um, because the world doesn't know him, so the world doesn't know they are the child of God because they haven't experienced his love because they don't know him. But interestingly, um, let's go to verse, uh, verse 10. It says, in this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifested. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. All right? So do you see, if you love, if you are born of God, you practice righteousness and you love your brother. So I'm not going to go deep here. I want to show you something here amazing. Verse 11. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. But which beginning? We are going to see which beginning. Which beginning? Is it the beginning I became a Christian? Is it the beginning you became a Christian? Is it the beginning that Jesus came? Is it the beginning that... Beginning. It's the beginning that God said that there be light? Which beginning he's talking about? So it says, for this... Uh, uh, verse 12... Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. So all of a sudden, he brings the story of the Cain and Abel. What happened in the story of Cain? So Eve comes, and Eve becomes pregnant, and he calls his firstborn Cain. Cain means, I got him from God. Cain's means I acquired of him. Cain is what, like, okay, I forced myself to receive from God. And then he becomes, and his brother Abel comes to the picture, and they both bring the sacrifice. Cain brings the sacrifice from the ground, and Abel brings the sacrifice of the sheep, the flock. 
and God accepts uh, the sacrifice of the Abel, and Cain gets upset. The first question is, okay, why did you bring sacrifice? Who told you to bring sacrifice? So Cain brings the sacrifice. So Cain is the first one that brings the sacrifice. But here's the thing. It says, okay, uh, um, why do you think Cain brought the sacrifice? Because he wanted to be accepted by God. But he brought the sacrifice from the ground. Which ground? The ground that the Lord God had cursed by Adam. And God told Adam, if you bring, if by the sweat of your face you reap the ground, and you, you, you're dust and you're going back to dust. So what did Cain say? Cain said, okay, I'm going to do this so God can be pleased by me. So I'm going to do this so God can be pleased by me, not knowing that is cursed. You can never produce out of the sweat of your face. Actually, you need to have the ground which has the sweat of the face of Jesus, the the blood that dropped on the ground when he was going to go to get crucified. So now Jesus is on the way going to get crucified and his, bl- his sweat becomes blood, falls into the ground, the ground that got cursed many years ago. Nice. Yes. Yes. And now, so that you can actually receive the abundance of life from the ground, not because you put your sweat in, but because he put your sweat out. Yeah. So now, he, Cain, Cain says, okay, he murders his brother because his works were wicked. wicked. That means, okay, he, brought, he did something to bring to God and accept it. And what did Cain do? Cain brought a sacrifice. But what did Cain, um, why did Cain bring a sacrifice? Uh, sorry, Abel. Abel brought the sacrifice right after Cain brought the sacrifice. You know what? Because Abel didn't bring a sacrifice for himself. He knew he was accepted. He knew he was righteous. He brought the sacrifice to God, interceding for his brother Cain. He is this, the type of Jesus. Yes. Jesus brought the sacrifice not for himself to be accepted. He brought a sacrifice for the brethren, the Cain. To to that we come to an understanding to receive the love and acceptance of the Father, not through the cursed works that we are doing, but through the love of the Father and understand that we are accepted. That's right. And right after that, Cain comes and he goes, he kills his brother. And guess what happened? He goes, he goes and reads this. Uh, if you go and read in Genesis chapter 4, Cain goes that because what I have done, I am cursed. Mm-hmm. I, am, cannot, I cannot be in your presence. God didn't say that. That's right. That's right. He separated himself from God. So in one of the sessions, I'm going to talk to you about the blood of Jesus and conscience. We will go to that story most probably. But here, what I, I want to link this to here, that G- Cain brought, um, Cain, that when sin entered the consciousness of man, man thought God is an enemy. But he came to reconcile the world to himself, not to reconcile himself to the world. Yeah. 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 If you think that God is your enemy, it's your sin conscience that is tying you and judging you and condemning you as risen above God and makes itself God in the temple of God. Ooh. Right? This is when you become God. The man of sin. So, so now, the, the, works, the works of Cain were wicked, so Abel brought a sacrifice to, so that Cain can receive the love of the Father, so Cain can see this. So Cain can see, oh, God accepted the sacrifice of Abel, oh, so he can accept me. But he didn't see that. He said, well, how come God accepted you and not me? You know what? I'm going to kill you. Get rid of you. That's the solution that man brings to the world. If we can just kill someone, then we can can get free. 
But the solution that Jesus brings to the world is if I can just show you love, you can set, get free. If I can give you life, you are free. So now, uh, look at that, verse 13. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. Okay, all of a sudden he brings a story of Cain and then Abel, and he says, Cain, okay, everyone look at me, Cain hated his brother Abel, so don't, think, don't be surprised when the world hates you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cain, Abel, world, you. Yeah. Yeah. It says, you know what? The whole story is about two brothers yeah. from the beginning. This is the love that we have talked, you know, from the beginning. Which beginning? The beginning in Genesis chapter 4, when two brothers shows up and the story of love starts yeah, yeah. between the two brothers. Yes. Yes. If you are the child of God, you can love your brother because you know he's also your brother with the same father. So now, who is, what is the world? Now, we... Um, do, we have verses that says, do not love the world and what is in it. We have another verse, verse that says, God so loved the world. Right. Yeah. God so loved Cain mm. that he sent Abel. But don't love Cain and his own ways. Right. Yes. Yes. The, story of, the story of the Bible is the story of two brothers. One hated another and one loved another. So now here it says, okay, guys, um, and we look at verse, three, verse 1 in chapter 3. What manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. So Cain was the children, child of God. Yes. As Abel was the child of God, but he did not know him. That's why he didn't love him. He didn't receive the love. So now, therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. So I'm getting a little deep here. I'm probably, this message was for the last session, but I'm going <laughs> to, but you guys are doing great. So I'm going to go a little deep here. Are you ready? Okay, so <clears throat> verse 14. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. Hold on. <laughs> Jesus said, if you believe me and my word, you shall never taste death. Okay? Uh -huh. But here it says, all right, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. I want to give a little meaning to this, all right? Now we want to see it. He, he who does not love his brother abides in death. Okay, whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. All right, so keep all those verses. I'm going to come back to it. Verse 16, by this we know love, because he laid down his soul, the word life there is soul, he laid down his soul for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for our brethren. He says, okay, if you're talking about love here, and he says, guys, this is love, that he laid down his life. He was the able that interceded for his brother. He was the able that who knew who he was before God and every prayer that he did, every offering he brought and everything he did, not because he wanted to be accepted, but because he wanted his brother to see that he's accepted by looking at him. It says, oh, you want to love your brother? Do the same. Know who you are. Yes. The moment you know who you are, you are loving your brother. Yes. <sighs> because someone will come and look at you and says, oh, this is who God is. This is what love is. Your life become a testimony, a prophecy for someone else. Your life become a light for someone else. If you want to love your brother, you do the same thing that Jesus did. He knew who he was. Yes. Now we go around and trying to love one another and we don't even know what love is. If I want to love you, I need to know who I am. Because the moment I know who I am, then I know who you are. And then, um, 
We know we have the Father. Yes. Right. So now, he says, but this, that he laid down his life for us, we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. So I'm going to get a little deep here, okay? So he's talking about life. He says, the moment you love, you have passed from death to life. All right. But when you abide in love, you have eternal life. So you know what happens? Okay, I, I'm in love. I have life. Now I'm walking around, but I'm walking through death. You come out of the death. Love walks you through death. Life walks you through death. Eternal life is not something that you will wake up one day, you realize your body is changed to immortal, and then you realize, oh my gosh, I'm in eternity, I can live. Eternal life is in the sun, and the sun is inside of you. And the moment you have that eternal life inside of you, you start walking in life. And let me tell you, life has the power to kill. If you walk in eternal life, you experience death. But what kind of death you're experiencing when you get to your brother? Right? When you get to your brother, what happens is he calls you to the field as Cain did. And then he gets up and he kills you. And you say, okay. If you want to love your brother, you die to self. If you want to love your brother, you don't get offended at your brother. If you love your brother, it's when your brother rises against you, you embrace him in love and you say, I have eternal life. You can have eternal life. I am loved by the Father. You can be loved by the Father. So if Jesus is disabled, he came here, and then he went around doing good, healing all, preaching the gospel, and all of a sudden people raised up against him. Jesus said, all of you are going to leave me. And all left, and some of us think that John didn't. John was there when they crucified Jesus. Do you know why John was there? Because his family was the high priest. The high priest told him to go. He didn't go because, oh, Jesus. He was from the family of the high priest. That's why he had boldness to go, because he knew they're not going to catch him. Yeah. Because he was from the high priest family. And people knew that, and nobody could catch him, but everyone else forsook him. So now Jesus is on the cross, and no one is there. <sighs> I think this is amazing. Three and a half years feeding them. They left their job and followed Jesus. Jesus was feeding not only 12 people, but thousands of people every day. <sighs> And now when was the time, and he said, you all are going to leave me, but I'm not alone. The father is with me. He's loving the brother. He knew who he was. He stood in who he really was. So now, uh, so it says, okay, now look at verse 14 again. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. It is when you are when you are abiding in love, you are abiding in life, and that life is taking you through death. It's not like jumping over death, skipping death into our life. It's like coming to a place of realizing that it is not me who live anymore, but Christ in me. It comes to a place of every time that we look at one another, we don't see the flesh. We don't see that we can, the love of God compels us to know if one died, all died. It's a place that knowing that who I am, so I can know who my brother is, is a place that when my brother rises up to to kill me, I say, you know what? If you kill me, I have eternal life. I'm going to raise from the dead in three days. Eternal life starts from today when you have, uh, when, when you live in life, you live. Yes. Yes. So, sometimes we think, oh, I'm not going to die. Well, 
You're not going to love your brother if you don't die. Eternal life means you're going to die. What are you dying to? To self. That nothing is going to be important anymore except my brother. When I'm going to the parking lot, I don't pray for the spot. I give my spot to my brother. (laughs) Oh, Father, thank you. You're going to find us a parking spot. Thank you. Oh, there's a car. Go, 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 go. And you go park. Make sure that they don't get it. Right? I've done that. I've done that, honestly. But all of a sudden, one day I realized that, oh, (laughs) probably Jesus would give his parking spot. (laughs) Brother, go. (laughs) So Jesus says that if you pick up your soul, if you want to save your soul, you lose it. But if you pick up your cross and follow me, when you pick up the cross, where do you go? Jesus, let me give you good news. Jesus is leading you to death. (laughs) You know, for so many years, we have learned to fix Adam. Adam is not fixable. Adam needs to die. You are not fixable. You need to die to self on the cross. When Jesus Christ came, he didn't die for you. He died as you. I love that one. Wow. He died as you. And if he died as you, he was resurrected as you. His resurrection is you and his death is you. So now, if you are picking up your cross, where are you going? To the cross. That's why in the book of Revelation, we see 144,000 from all tribes and, and peoples are following the Lamb. Where are you going? Going to die. <laughs> I'm not coming. <laughs> right? Some people are like, you are crazy. That's the wisdom of God. That's the wisdom of God. <laughs> um, quickly, can I say 144,000 is 12 multiplied by 12 multiplied 1,000. 12 is the 12 tribes of Israel. And 12 is the number of perfection of heaven and earth together. The city, the tribe, the people of God. 1,000 year, 1, is 1,000 years, which is one day, which is the reigning with the Lord. So 144,000 is the completion of people who are following the Lamb to have to reign. Where are they reign? What are they reigning over? They're reigning over their life. They are following the Lamb. They are reigning over their thoughts. Adam, the mind that the world gave them, the nature that Adam gave them, they are overcoming their nature by deciding to leave that behind and following the Lamb of God to the death. Right? This is 144,000. So now, here you're following Jesus to the death because if you want to save your soul, you're going to lose it. But if you follow me, first I'm going to kill you and get rid of what couldn't help, what couldn't let you to grow into the fullness of the Son of God. If you follow me, we are going to put to death what's holding you back so that you can be manifested as the true Son of God. And you know what? You're going you're gonna to love your brother. When Jesus picked up his cross, he didn't one day say, okay, I'm going to pick up my cross, everyone, I'm going to uh, Calvary. He didn't do that. People killed him. Cain. If you want to follow him to cross, you can't crucify yourself. Your brother needs to crucify you. (laughs) Your brother needs to crucify you. And the moment he does, you say, Father, forgive him, for he doesn't know what he is doing. 
And the same people who crucified Jesus later on met him and became Christian and following him to the same path. And now the story continues up into the today. So you can't pick up the cross and follow Jesus if you don't have Cain around you. <laughs> well, thank God for Cain. <laughs> we can finally die. <laughs> What's a death? I love it. This is called eternal life. If you want to live life, you need to go through death. And then you live. So you live, you die, and you live. Yes. All right, so let's continue. So, and then I'm going to wrap up. So, verse 17. Uh, you know what? Let's go. Okay, I'm going to read because we want us to read the context here. Verse 17. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? What was the need that your brother has? What was the need that Cain had? Lack of identity. Lack of the knowing of who God is. Lack of love. My little brethren, uh, children, verse 18, my little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. What is the truth? Jesus, uh, the Apostle Paul writes to Mm, uh, the church of Galatians and he says oh you foolish one who has bewitched you that you do not obey the truth in front of whose eyes Jesus Christ was portrayed as crucified if you want to love your brother is portraying of crucifixion of Jesus in your life is showing your brother that you are on the cross basically now, I want to get to this because I want to uh, talk about verse 20, but let's read verse 19. And by this we know that we are of the truth, and we shall assure our hearts before him. So do you see, when you are in the truth and you are in the love, your heart is in assurance. But what is the assurance? Verse 20, for if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Okay, let's read here. Every word is important in this book. <laughs> Every single word. I'm happy that I started reading it in English because when I was reading, I had no idea what does every word mean, and I had to go find out. So that's why it's important. Every word is important. It says, guys, if your heart condemns you, and the word condemns means knows something against you. But in the context, it's talking about Cain. If your heart knows something against you towards your brother. Okay? But know this, that um, God is greater than our heart. Okay, hold on a second. It says, when the moment your heart starts condemning you, that means your heart becomes a judge. And that means your heart becomes God to you. Because it tells you what to do and condemns you or whatever. But it says, know this, that God is greater than your heart. It says, okay, it's going to be time that your heart starts toward your brother. Mm -hmm. But in that moment, you realize your heart is not your God, and your heart could deceive you, but God is greater than your heart. And, and knows all things. God knows all things, not your heart. It says, if your heart knows something against you or against your brother, you all need, just need to know that God knows all things. That means your heart doesn't know all things. Right? Okay. So, beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God, and whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandment and do things that are pleasing in His sight. The commandment was love. And things that are pleasing in his sight is love your brother, according to this the context. It says this. It says, okay, guys, if your heart doesn't condemn you, and whatever you ask God, it will be given to you. But there are times that your heart condemns you. But if you realize in that moment 
that God is greater than your heart. Even when your God, heart condemns you, even that moment you can receive whatever you asked. Amen. Let me repeat it again. If your heart condemns you, you don't receive things. Because your heart doesn't let you. Your conscience doesn't qualify you to receive what you are asking. But it says the moment you are in the love, you come to a place that your heart starts condemning you, and then you don't see yourself qualified, loved, to receive this thing from God or anything. And then, but in that moment, you realize that your heart is nothing. And if that moment you realize that God is greater, then you can still receive everything, even your heart is condemned. You. <sighs> We have limited God yes. to our beliefs. Yes. 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 If you don't believe, you don't. in the moment that you don't believe, you can just say, he believes. We have become so self-conscious and we think like, oh, I need, do I have faith? Do I have, do I need, oh, okay, okay. And before we know, we are just looking at ourselves and self-conscious and we don't receive anything because it's all about us and not him. Yes. It says, okay, in that moment that you're concerned about your faith, there's a verse in First Timothy that uh, Paul is writing. It says, even when you're faithless, he is faithful. That means in a moment that your heart is condemning you, you don't have faith, you are in weakness, guess what? He's not limited to that. If you just know that, oh, he's greater. And we were actually, yesterday we were sharing, I want to share with you guys now today. Uh, the verse before that, it says, if you deny him, he will deny you. And oh man, how could they condemn people? Don't, don't deny Jesus. Just, he's going to deny you. No. He says, if you deny him, he will deny you. That means you just denied him. So if you deny him, he will deny that you denied him. Come on. <laughs> if you deny him, he will deny the fact that you denied him. Basically, he says, you know what? I love you. You just denied me. I'm going to deny that you denied me. <laughs> and then he says, if you're faithless, he is faithful because he cannot deny himself. Yes. Oh, guys, this is good. Oh, man, this is so good. What a God. Wow. Hallelujah. Okay. Um, look at verse seven, chapter 4, verse 17. Ah, oh, so good. <clears throat> Okay, 417. Love has been perfected among us in this. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. Yes. <laughs> God, love has been perfected. So first of all, do you see there is a perfection that is happening? Yes. So the perfection of all of us as sons of God is the perfection of love in us. If we are being perfected to a perfect man, that means love becomes perfect in us. And the love, okay, here's the thing. Love doesn't get perfected between God and me together. Let me put you, let me say this. God, oh God, God, this is not the perfect love. So when I have someone else here, uh, can I have someone, can you? Yeah, yeah thank you. We want to have the perfect love here. 
All right. What's your name? Jessica. Jessica. Okay. Jessica here has amazing relationship with God. Okay. So she is like <laughs> receiving everything. And then I'm here and then I have this amazing re relationship with God. But this love is not perfect. There's this God here, gives love here, gives love here. But this cycle is not perfect unless Jessica receives the love and give it to me. And I receive the love and give it to him. So the love of God came to me and it will not be perfected unless it's passed to someone else. And then he is going, and this cycle of love becomes perfect. Yes. All right, thank you. <laughs> That's why the love and relationship with Jesus is very personal, but we are not the individual beings. We are a body together, yes. one another. This love, it won't be perfect if we don't show love to one another. If I don't receive the love of God from you, I haven't received the perfect love. Yes. Yes. Right? So now, the interesting part is, in the context, when he's talking about the condemning your heart, is toward your brother. Because love needs to be perfected in you. When you find yourself in a place that your heart starts um, knowing something against yourself towards your brother, that's when the cycle of perfection is about to be break, broken. So that's why you realize that, oh no, God is greater. He knows all things. So that this perfect love can go into the cycle and that this cycle of love keeps going, the life starts producing out of it. So we cannot live eternal life if love is not moving or perfecting in us. So now here it says, we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Which judgment? We just read it in chapter 3, verse 20. The judgment of your heart. What did we read in verse 20? If your heart condemns you, that means your heart is the judge. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It says, if love is perfected in you, you have boldness in the day of judgment. Which day? The day that your heart is rising up to judge you. But love is perfected in you. And then you know God is greater. So you don't go under the judgment of your heart. You keep yourself under the judgment of the love of the Father. Hallelujah. And then since you have boldness, you know, the word boldness, it's used for boldness of a speak. The one, who, someone who's, uh, the one who is bold to speak this boldness. Yeah. Yeah. So in the day of judgment that your heart starts condemning you things, then you have boldness to speak what? Love. Then you have boldness to speak what the true judge spoke about you. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No. Hallelujah. Because as he is, so are we in this world. Wow, come on. This is, so as he is, we are yes. in this world. Because we have come to this love experience with the Father that brings us into a place of realizing this is who he is and this is who I am. Mm -hmm. You know, in Genesis, God goes around and he uh, speaks to things, you know. He says, let the earth bring forth trees. Let the water bring forth um, living creatures. Let the trees bring forth fruit. He speaks to creation to bring forth something. When it comes to creating man, he turns to himself and he commands himself to bring forth something that is just like him. He says, let us make man in our own image. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. He speaks to himself to be fruitful yes. yeah. and multiply yeah. and produce something that is just like himself. That's why when love is perfected, as he is, so are you. That's right. yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. 
<laughs> this is so good. You can't find these things in religion. Yeah. Let me tell you that. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, let's read the couple of next couple of verses. Verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Okay, so here's the thing. It says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So everything that God does, it's because of love. And let me tell you this, love doesn't make sense. <laughs> that doesn't make sense at the love of God according to the mind of Adam, according to the, na the fleshly natural uh, nature, love doesn't make sense. But interestingly, God so loved the world, so everything that God is doing, it's not for himself. It's for us because he loves us. It's out of that love. And, and the reason is he knows who he is. Jesus didn't come to prove anything to himself. Actually, that's the voice of the devil. If you are the son of God... Let me tell you, can I give an, Jesus is going to this wilderness, and he just heard a voice, and the father says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus is going around, father, ha, ha. this is Rose's translation. <laughs> but <laughs> I picture things, you know. So all of a sudden, a thought comes to him. If you are the son of God, why don't you prove it? Oh, turn the stones to bread. Right? The first thing, if you are the son of God, why don't you do this? You know, let me give you a day-to-day example so it can make sense to us. I'm going to go pray for this person. I believe Jesus heals. All right, in Jesus' name, be healed. All right, check. No, I didn't get healed. Probably I didn't have faith. Mm -hmm. right? That happens all the time, probably. But you know what it says? This thing, you didn't see, it got healed, and then it spoke to you, telling you who you are. Yeah. This thing just told you you don't have faith, but who you are is what he says. That's right. yeah. This person gets healed or not doesn't define if I am who I am. Yeah. I believe because I am the son of God. Yeah. I believe because son lives inside of me. I believe because this is who I am. I don't try to believe anything. I believe. Yes. Yes. If you are the son of God, do something. And when we do something and that doesn't happen, and then we say, well, maybe something's wrong. Maybe, you know what, I should, I should do this. This didn't work. Yeah, you're right. And then we go around trying to prove who we are. In Genesis, God said, be, be, be to nature and everything be, and for years and years, we are trying to be. <laughs> and God here says, be the son of God. Yes. You are, as I am. And we want to go around try to be the son of God. So people get important. Everything around us becomes important and tries to define our identity, not knowing what he says about us. This is who we are. My experiences tells me things. My thought tell my heart starts speaking. My so-and-so and so-and-so talks to me. And all of a sudden, before I know, I am the product of my environment. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I wanted to commit suicide when I was 19. <laughs> because things started giving me identity. But now we come to a place and realize now as he is, so are we. All right, so let's get up and pray. Let, let's just 
if you want to get up. And I just want to pray for all of us. So we wrap up. It's 12, and I don't want to stay longer. <clears throat> Yes, Jesus. What a God, huh? What a God. Let's shout for Jesus. Yay, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. What a God. We are who you say we are. We refuse to look at ourselves and judge ourselves. Our mind and heart has no place to speak to us who we really are. Because what you say, because you know all things and we don't. And you know us who we are before the foundation of the world. And we thank you, Lord, that you... you you speak to yourself and you commanded us to come out of you so that we can be just like you even on earth. And Father, I pray for all of us here in this room and everyone who's going to listen to the videos or audios later on, I pray that the spirit of revelation will come upon us and rest into our heart. And I thank you, Father, that you're stretching our heart and understanding so we can comprehend the scriptures and we can understand the truth of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you that you're breaking down, hammering down the walls that are around our minds and hearts, those identities that we have built for ourselves from people and from from countries and locations and experiences of life to bring them down, Lord. We thank you for the word of truth, that truth has the power to break down, to break down what needs to be broken. And we thank you, Lord, for the death that we can experience in you, the death that brings the freedom, the death that we can experience the love of the Lord Jesus Christ and Father. Wow. We thank you, Father. Just put your hand on your heart and put one of your hand on your head. And I say, in this conference, I am ready to hear. My heart is open. My mind is open. I have a narrow-minded mind. <laughs> oh, Father, thank you for your truth. Thank you. Repeat after me. Thank you for your truth. I am ready to be changed. I want to be changed. I will be changed. You are greater than my, my weakness. You are, you are greater than my strength. I thank you, Father, that you open up my heart. It stretch out my understanding. I can understand the truth deeper. And I thank you for the spirit that empowers me to walk the reality of life. In Jesus' name.